our topic today is perfection is self transcendence so what is perfection the dictionary tells us that perfection is doing everything flawlessly right so we are all in this world trying to do that exactly aren't we always looking for perfection and why because we feel we want to improve the world we want the world to become a better place to live but can we really define perfection i'll give you a simple example which i thought uh, which is a personal experience aloo ki sabji right all our husbands think that the mother's aloo ki sabji is the perfect aloo ki sabji but i don't think a lot of wives agree with that <laughs> yeah. so what is perfection what defines a tasty dish when i'm doing a work in office sometimes my report you know i feel perfect report is that which i submit before the deadline with no mistakes flawless perfect but then comes another colleague who gives a beautifully made report you know not needed but has put the graphs and charts and everything you know makes it so readable flawless again no mistakes and submits it is that perfect then comes along another colleague who says not just one report let me give another solution to this you know problem and this report so he makes two reports and submits it before the deadline what is perfect in this world which is relative absolute perfection is something which is very difficult to define right we can only think in terms of comparison this report is better than that report isn't it but we look for perfection in the world world is not perfect the master said swami ji said that duality extremes exist in this world but what are we looking for constant joy constant love constant pleasure but they say that where there is light shadow is inherent where there is joy suffering is there and both come like waves of the ocean one after the other joy then there will be suffering then joy because swami ji gives an example of an ocean he says there are crests and there are troughs in the ocean right but the water remains the same so if there is a crest somewhere trough has to be made and also the more scary part is that that crest will soon become a trough and the trough will soon become a crest so it's always going to change where are we looking for perfection here there is no perfection that exists in this world right so okay i just said perfection doesn't exist but if you are really looking at mona lisa a really beautiful painting a really beautiful song what is it that creates beauty in us if we reflect for a moment what makes something really beautiful maybe not perfect but beautiful what makes it really beautiful don't you think it's the harmony on paper right everything just kind of blends together beautifully that poem not a word out of place right the colors all blended beautifully symmetrically spatially hari har is an architect he will support that the beauty comes in symmetry right so that peace and harmony when we can bring it on paper then we start to see beauty right and maybe we are inching towards perfection so swami ji says that we can only create a perfect work in this world when we create it from inside of us from a place of peace and harmony right so he says ego consciousness doesn't work right soul consciousness when we work from then we can do perfect things why because soul consciousness knows harmony how does it know harmony because it knows that there is no difference we are one with everything in this world obviously there is going to be harmony there is nothing different to be discordant with we are one with everything we are in complete harmony with nature we are in complete harmony with creation right that is where we are coming from then we create a perfect work or a piece of art so swami ji says allow the divine consciousness to flow through move yourself away right let your ego go and swami ji should know he wrote over 400 pieces of books of works of you know music so he said whatever was done in my name was not my work 
right it was always the masters flowing through me and i just became the perfect channel for this work and what was so perfect about it it was in fact effortless he said i think for the bhagavad gita such an important deep scripture he completed it in 3 months he said humanly he himself said humanly it was impossible to do that work right so it's effortless flowing and why is it so perfect every person who comes in touch with it who comes in contact with it what do we feel completely touched right we feel uplifted in that energy and that he says is the perfect work right as this reading says be you perfect as thy father in heaven is perfect where are we looking for this perfection yes the masters are telling us to be perfect but if we look at perfection outwardly can we ever be perfect we have so many roles in this world husband wife right mother child son so many are we perfect in every role you have a business rival probably you dislike him deeply right but when he is a father in his house his children love him deeply his wife probably loves him deeply as well so where is perfection in this world swami ji said about gandhi ji he said he was a saint he brought all of india together and a very important part of our freedom struggle to get freedom for india right was he perfect he was perfectly dedicated to the country's independence but what about in his own own family his children always felt that he sacrificed their personal happiness for the nations so in this world outwardly perfection is difficult what is perfect then it's inwardly right again when we can transcend that ego consciousness when we forget when we realize that we are not this limited body we are not this limited mind then our real nature our soul consciousness which is perfect which is blemishless stainless and pure that shines through and that is perfect right so how do we live in this world we need to live and act as though we are limitless we are already the soul consciousness we need to live in this expansive consciousness right but we hear this somebody hurts us what happens immediately our energy contracts we want to strike back because we want to defend our ego right we want to defend ourselves he should not do this again to us but what do the masters do how do they live what did christ just say in the reading bless those who curse you there is a hadith a islamic text prophet muhammad it is said that one day somebody came running to prophet muhammad master master that tribe out there wants to do you harm it wishes you ill will it curse them so that you know they are doomed so what did prophet muhammad say he said rather i will bless them that they find god right so this is what the masters do and this is our choice every day do we want to live in ego or do we want to live in ego transcendence in soul consciousness in that little self transcendence right we we feel we want, if we live in ego it's always going to create a kind of barrier a separateness from everyone everybody is a threat we live in fear isn't it when we say i want to forgive but what if he does it again he'll do even more to me or he'll take advantage of me this is the ego speaking which fears everything right but the minute we start to forgive the minute we start to accept other people's realities we start to accommodate and understand them then we start to transcend the ego now i read this in a whatsapp which is commonly doing the rounds right now sometimes they are good <laughs> what happened in that it said be like a tree that when people throw stones at you yeah everyone's heard that you shower fruits now that's a big thing you know there's the story of a zen uh, of a buddhist monk i think who was uh, you know standing by a river and somebody was watching him what was this monk doing 
he was trying to pick up the scorpion from the river and put him on the shore so that he could save the scorpion. But the minute he would pick up the scorpion, it would bite him and with pain he had to just release it. And this kept on going on and this person is like, you know, uh, what are you doing? He comes to the monk, monk and he says, what are you doing? If there are too many bites, you're going to die with the poison. So he says, what can I do? It is the nature of the scorpion to bite me. But it is my nature to rescue him. So this is what they are. Their hearts are completely open. There is no ego left to defend, to save. The body is no longer an important, it's just a medium to do welfare for others. You must have read so many stories of master doing exactly the same thing. Being in America in those times, they never had seen a Hindu or an Indian before. Right? So he faced a lot of prejudice, maybe hatred, maybe many insinuations. And what did he do? Did he ever say, oh no, I'm good, you know, I'm this, this, this and my religion is so great or my country is so great. Never tried to defend himself, never tried to defend anything. In fact, what did he do? He would go up to that person and calm him down because his only thought was, how can I help him? And if you see the endings of all the stories, all of those detractors ended up becoming disciples. So this is how we touch people, not by defending our ego. They are always going to constantly keep coming back on us. But when we go with that attitude that we want to help you, ego, no, soul consciousness, yes, that divine consciousness when it flows through us. Then and then alone, we are perfect and allow this perfection in this world. Let me end with the story. Um, you know, uh, Yukteswar ji, master was in Yukteswar ji's ashram, right? Uh, when he was training and this story he recites in the autobiography of a yogi. He says sometime after maybe few weeks or few months of living in the ashram with his guru, master is like, now I've had enough of the ashram duties, I am going to meditate continuously and go to the Himalayas. So he decides that's where I will f quickly find God. So he tells Yukteswarji, this is what I am going to do. So Yukteswarji kind of hinted, you know, mountains, if they gave self-realization, the goats would be self-realized. You need a self-realized master to be with you, right, to guide you. But he didn't give a firm no, so master took it as a yes and his permission and he goes away. After many experiences, finally he realizes, no, I need to be with my guru and he comes back. Now he's a little shamefaced because he just left suddenly, you know, and he's like, now guru probably will be angry with me. So he reaches and Yukteswarji says, oh, you've come. Come, let's see in the kitchen. Is there something to eat? So Yoganandji is like, what? Aren't you angry with me? If I had left even my father and left all my duties and gone, he would also have been angry with me. So Yukteswarji says a very beautiful thing. He says, why should I be angry with you? Nothing anybody can do can ever anger me because I want nothing from you except your own happiness. Right? So this is how these masters are and from their example we learn what true perfection is. What do we do? Give everybody a remote control to our happiness. Right? You come and hurt me, now I'm going to be depressed for 10 days. You do this to me and I'm going to be unhappy for another 5 days. So no, let's learn that divine, there is nothing going to be achieve, achieved because we are living in an imperfect world. Right? Nobody is going to be convinced by you, by your greatness, you know, by your great nature. Nobody is going to be really convinced by you. The only way you can convince them of your perfection is by giving love to all of them. Thank you. So let me start um, a satsang with a disclaimer. My wife's alu sabji is better than my mom's. <laughs> no, I'm not, I, that was not a joke. <laughs> Anyway, um, when we strive to achieve perfection in this outer world, and I just realized yesterday that this topic was uh, the same topic I presented last year, the same time, and uh, Gaurav, Brahmachari Gaurav should be here, but uh, he is not present, so I am uh, presenting uh, 
this part. So, when we talk about perfection, let's ask ourselves a question. How many of you think, uh, feel here that you guys are, you guys are perfect in your work? Just show your hands. No one? Oh, how many of you want to be perfect in your work or anything? So those of you online, everybody raised their hands here. <laughs> <laughs> and we try to express that in many ways. Uh, people want a perfect body and perfect dress or a makeup and when it comes to Ananda also, we guys also seek perfection in, you know, being a perfect disciple, perfect instrument of God. Somewhere we want to be perfect. And why do we want to be perfect is a question we need to ask. Why not just be ourselves? Why should we be perfect? What is there in it for us? The innate uh, want, the need to be perfect is because God is perfect. And by wanting to be perfect, we are actually seeking God. By wanting to be perfect in the outer world, we are wanting to, we are trying to see God in the outer world. Unfortunately, that is more or less not possible. But it is possible for saints because they don't start it start seeking the perfection outside themselves, but they first seek perfection within themselves and then project it on the outer world. And autobiography, Paramahansa Yogananda says that Yukteswarji was a perfectionist, real perfectionist, and he was hypercritical about his disciples. Once our guru was sitting on the floor, when I mean, master stood up, and there were other people, everybody stood up and Paramahansa Yogananda also stood up fast. When he stood up, the asana on, his, on which he was sitting got wrinkled. It's natural, but he wanted his disciple to be mindful even of that movement. He just criticized him out there in front of him. Look at him, look at him, how he is standing up. And, but of course, Paramahansa Yogananda, he... Um, says that, you know, he used to be hypercritical, but I wanted God, I wanted what Yukteswarji had. And other saints also, for example, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda in the same book, Autobiography of Yogi, says that perfection has been achieved. Now, for example, he gives a Sanskrit as uh, a language which has been perfected. He writes, uh, Sanskrita means polished, complete. Sanskrit is the, uh, literally means, uh, what to say, uh, the script is Devanagari and it is called Divine Abode and Panini says that it is the perfect language and how they were able to achieve it because first they found God and they were able to achieve that perfection outside, not the other way around. And uh, we also have other, uh, you know, descriptions of perfections. And Paramahansa Yogananda says that Upanishads classify what perfection means, what perfect, being perfect actually means. Being perfect doesn't mean, depend upon the work we do or how we speak or it's not about the outward world but about the inner achievement. And... Uh, he writes that the Upanishads have minutely classified every stage of spiritual advancement. A Siddha means a perfected being, has progressed from the state of a Jivan Mukta, freed while living, to that of a Paramukta, supremely free. So a perfected being is called Siddhas. And for us to reach there is not impossible. All our masters are here to convey this to us, to help us reach that perfection. Once during a Kriya initiation, where Swami Kriyananda was also present in that initiation, he said of there were many angels and, uh, you know, uh, 
and uh, saints were there, uh, were astral, was astrally present in that in, during the Kriya initiation. And he said, those who are here, many of you will be Jeevan Muktas and Siddhas. So that is a possibility for us to, to become perfect, to become that perfect being. But to reach there, what should we do? Now, of course, there is a perfect technique given by Paramahansa Yogananda called Kriya Yoga. He also writes again, he says that for a human mind to become perfect, to be able to perfectly express God's consciousness, we need to live a healthy life, uh, uh, you know, for millions of years, but Kriya fastens the process of that. Uh, and helps us to express divine consciousness perfectly. But between those two practices, what we do is very much important as much as the practice itself. To begin with, perfection is self-transcendence. And this self, what we talk about here, is our ego, which is identified, our soul, which is identified with the body, so it is ego. And it is not just identified, it is tied to our body with likes and dislikes. So how are we going to work out that likes and dislikes? And it isn't that simple because I like these things. From today on, I will dislike them. I dislike these things, so I will like them from today on. End result, I still have likes and dislikes. It just changed places. So instead of operating on likes and dislikes, the best way to live in this world is to Tune into God's will for you, what God wants to do. And the answer here is the, we cannot have live by a set of rules. For example, there are seemingly contradictory um, you know, teachings or actions done by great saints. Uh, when Jesus Christ was crucified, he prayed for those who were crucifying him. He said that, he prayed that God forgive them because they, know, they don't know what they are doing. And he also said, do you think that if I ask my heavenly father, he would send a legion of angels and I can be saved? But it is his will to be crucified. So I am letting it happen. At the same time, um, Guru Gobind Singh was again enlightened. He organized an army to fight. You know, he didn't say, you know, when people were attacking the village, he did not say that, oh, forgive them, they know not what they are doing. So it is like two enlightened saints. And uh, Master was also a warrior in previous incarnations. How are their actions different? And Swami Kriyananda was faced with the same questions. Uh, and uh, how to, you know, work it out. Should I do this or should I do that? It was a tricky place and always Parama, uh, Swami Kriyananda guided the person that anyone asking such questions uh, tune in to what God wants you to do. And that is much more important. And how do we tune in? Of course, by meditation, by practicing uh, regular meditation by asking Guru and asking their guidance and their guidance is always present. Recently I was uh, very much uh, irritated and agitated of something and because of an incident and I was of course performing my own purification ceremony in my mind throwing whatever I don't need into the fire. I was like God, I don't want this, take it, and I'm throwing, let this be burnt, let this be purified, because I'm <clears throat> not thinking straight. And suddenly, when I, after I, I, we were in the same room, I looked into Babaji's photo there, gazed deeply, and I said the prayer, but this time the prayer came in the correct words. I offer up this to you. I knew the words, but I was not implementing because I was not thinking straight. But when I said, I offer up this to you, it was gone. The situation was same, the decision was same, the opinion remained same, but inwardly I became freed. So that include masters in your prayer, include, take that guidance from them and then 
apply yourself, ask them what you want to do. To be perfect is to follow God's will for you. It might be right or wrong in others' eyes, that doesn't matter. But to live, not, don't, do, not, do not live by your likes and dislikes, but live as per God's will. And I'll end the satsang with a prayer. This prayer is from the book of prayers and poems, Whispers and e from Eternity. Tune us that we may hear thy voice. Volumes of thy Saviour voice resound through the loudspeaker of every loving heart. The voice of thy wisdom roams through the ether of space, seeking everywhere hearts that are tuned to ecstasy. Sadly, thy warning sermons pass unheard by souls deafened with the static of sense pleasures. O divine broadcaster, tune our souls, long distracted by the static of our, influ in static of our indifference. Fine-tune us with a delicate touch of soul perception. Grant us the privilege of hearing thy magic melodies in the ecstasy of divine awakening.